Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, the next talk by Lucy will be about uh, the internals of the OSX kernel. Um, she'll tell us a bit about uh, how it works and uh, that it uh, apparently uh, is Unix in there somewhere hidden uh, after all. Uh, please welcome Lucy. Um, welcome to my talk inside the Mac OS X kernel. I chose the subtitle, Debunking Mac OS Myths, because there are quite a few buzzwords associated with Mac OS X that are not, are not entirely true. Like, is it Unix or Mac or whatever? Like, for example, Paul Thorod writes, on the Mac, this kernel is called Mac, and it's based on rock-solid Unix technology. Well, let's talk about that. And a company named Apple states, with its stable open source core based on FreeBSD 5. It is stable, right? And yet another Apple quote, Unix based. The question is, if it is Unix, why haven't they been sued by the, by the SEO? <laughs> Mr. Jobs must know better, right? He says, Leopard is 64-bit top to bottom. I guess it all depends on how you define bottom. <laughs> and this is my favorite. Obsolete microkernel dooms Mac OS X to lag Linux in performance. This article goes into lens pointing out why microkernels are inherently slower. Microkernel? Microkernel? Uh, so far with the buzzwords. To clarify them, we'll first have a brief look at the history of the operating system. In 1984, Apple introduced Macintosh. It <laughs> it ran on a machine with 128K of RAM, a 68K CPU, and it ran off floppies, and it did not support multitasking. Ten years later, System 7 was now running on PowerPC, and it finally supported multitasking. But it was not really PowerPC native, because large chunks were still emulated 68K code. And multitasking has only been retrofit, and it was only cooperative. So there was still no memory protection. From an architectural perspective, System 7 couldn't even keep up with Windows 95. The same year, Apple decided to do it like Microsoft had done it with Windows NT. They decided to write a new operating system from scratch, but with the same API, so that the old applications could run unmodified. This project was called Copeland, and it looked like that. But it slipped and slipped and slipped, and it finally got canceled in 1996, because at that time, Apple had realized that this project was going nowhere and that it would probably never be released. They had handed out a few previews to developers, but there was no consumer product. So, Apple looked for an operating system to buy. There's something not really working. Oh, sorry. So Apple looked, like I said, for an operating system to buy. And they had a closer look at two operating systems of the time. One was Steve Jobs' next step. Steve Jobs was the former head of Macintosh development. And he had left Apple in 1985. And then he founded the company Next. Here's a screenshot of Next Step from an hour, around 1995. Option number two was BOS. The company B was founded by job successor to Macintosh development. Called, he was called <laughs> Jean-Louis Gassé. And Jean-Louis Gassé had also left Apple in 1991. And here's a screenshot of BOS, also from 1995. Apple talked to Gassi about buying BOS, but ultimately they decided on buying Next. Next step became the next operating system, and Steve Jobs was the new CEO. So, what about Next? <laughs> 
The mission of the company was not to compete with Apple, but to design more high-end computers that were targeted at the education market with its own operating system that would fit well into the typical university infrastructure. One interesting fact about Next Step is that Tim Berners-Lee developed the first web browser on a Next machine. And probably more important, the level editor for Doom was developed on Next Step. <laughs> but let's look at the history of the Next Step operating system. Like I just said, Next was founded in 1985, and Next Step 1 was quite a powerful operating system with a Unix base. It supported preemptive multitasking, had memory protection, a display PostScript GUI, and it ran on 68K hardware. So it was definitely more advanced than the Macintosh released five years earlier. One other significant release was 3.1, because Next opened it to other CPU architectures, i386, PA RISC, and Spark, SunSpark. When Apple acquired Next Step in 1996, it was ported to PowerPC, and they added some core classic macOS technologies like the HFS file system, QuickTime, Toolbox, which is the GUI library, iTunes, and sadly, Finder. They also added a VMware-like virtual machine monitor called Classic to run the old Mac OS and its applications on the new operating system. But they didn't release a product, just a preview for developers under the name Rhapsody. Mac OS X, the desktop Mac OS X, was not released until 2001. In 2005, the i386 port was revived with the introduction of the Intel-based Macs. The final version was released in 2006, but they had handed out the developer's preview in 2005. Well, let's look at the architecture of Mac OS X, and we'll start with the kernel, which is called X and U. X and U stands for X is not Unix. <laughs> <laughs> and so much for Mac OS X being Unix but more on this later. The kernel consists of three major parts that are Mark, BSD, and the I.O. kit. Mark was originally a research project at Carnegie Mellon University, the CMU, started in 1985. Mark is the microkernel project, so let's first look at the difference between a monolithic kernel and a microkernel. <clears throat> Untraditional monolithic kernels like Unix, BSD, Linux, other components run in kernel mode, like the file system framework, security components, user mode interface, the network stack, and device drivers. And besides those, the, besides those things, the parts that really need to be in kernel mode also run in kernel mode. <laughs> On a microkernel, the kernel user boundary is moved, ba moved down, so only the really necessary parts run in kernel mode. Again, the scheduler, memory manager, the interprocess communication, and low-level hardware access. Components like the file system or networking are each implemented in their own address spaces in user mode. Microkernels have the advantage that a crash in a driver, some file system logic or a network protocol, does not have to necessarily bring the system down, the whole system. In many cases, the faulty component can just be restarted, just like a user application. A similar advantage applies to the security vulnerabilities in a component. If malicious code runs in the context of a network driver, it doesn't have full control over the system. And in addition, dividing the kernel into components makes it more maintainable. Because it was simpler, CMU decided not to rewrite their own set of user mode components. So they decided to reuse BSD kernel code base. Here's BSD. And they ripped out the components that were already implemented by Mark and ran the rest in user space as a single server. <clears throat> On the next two slides, I'll demonstrate how communication between a user's process and the BSD server works on a microkernel. For comparison, 
Let's first look at a monolithic kernel. Here's a task in user mode that makes a system call to, for example, write. And this is not much more than a function call because um, it is a kernel user switch, but the address space stays the same. And the kernel function does its job and returns to the user in the same way. On a microkernel, the kernel does not have an implementation for write. Write is implemented in the BSD server. So the program has to send a message with a request to the BSD server using IPC. It calls the IPC function in the kernel. The kernel then switches address spaces to the BSD server. The message gets delivered to the BSD server. The BSD server performs the function, returns to the kernel, and the kernel switches address spaces again and returns to the user. The problem with this design is that address space switches invalidate the TLB, the translate, translation lookaside buffer, which is the cache for virtual memory mapping. And consequently, virtual to address space lookups become lower after a switch until the TLB is repopulated. So all in all, this leads to performance problems. <clears throat> because of this performance loss, the CMU decided to move the kernel user boundary up so that BSD and MARC are both run in kernel mode. This is referred to as collocation. Consequently, Mac OS X does not have a microkernel design because since next step one, the combination of MARC, which is the actual microkernel, and BSD run in kernel mode. The question you might ask now is, isn't this just like a monolithic kernel? Well, it is. But this combination has its, has its advantages too. Like, there's a clean separation of machine management and BSD compatibility parts of the kernel. It makes the kernel more tidy and well abstracted. And Mark had many improvements too especially over the BSD equivalence of its components. For example, the memory management of Mark is better than the BSD one, until BSD copied it then. Talking about Mark, let's talk about the jobs or tasks of the Mark code. On the left side of the picture, you see physical address space, and Mark manages mapping from virtual address spaces to physical addresses. These address spaces are called tasks, and Mark does the memory management. <coughs> These tasks are policy-free, which means address spaces are just a set of pages. There's no user ID, no working directory, no command line or associated terminal, or environment variables, or practically all the other fields that you get by typing PS on a Unix-like system. Mac, sorry, Mark <laughs> allows one or more threads per task, and it does scheduling. Mark also, my computer is slow, sorry. Mark also does sending, sends messages between tasks, so it does IPC. Neither the memory management nor scheduling are really worth having a look at, but IPC is a distinguishing feature to other kernels. So we talk about Mark IPC. A task can have any number of ports, and there are sender and receiver ports. The blue ones are sender ports, and the red ones are receiver ports. Mark messages get sent asynchronously, so the recipient can be busy and doesn't have to accept the message immediately, because the kernel buffers them, which means it puts them into a queue puts them into a queue, and here's another message. Sent and put into the queue. If the recipient then wants to pick up a message, the oldest one gets picked up first, and the next one. Um, the most common use case for IPC on a microkernel is the RPC, which is the remote procedure call, a function call across 